we decided that there were a lot of people that were very happy with their introduction to the University of Houston Center with Evelyn Merce. So with those good comments, I thought it was a good idea to introduce you to the latest prairies in our area that are becoming active. We will start with Davis talking about the Dick Benoit Prairie with help from Lisa Hardcastle. Davis Clay is a NIPSOT member and Galveston Bay Area Master Naturalist. He started volunteering for nature conservation and birding about seven years ago. He took the 2018 September Master Naturalist class and has been very active with a variety of activities since then. He is especially active in prairie restoration and birding. He is a retired IT engineer and project manager for the oil industry. And before that, he was a sail maker. A few years ago, he learned about a local remnant prairie in Leak City called the Dick Benoit Prairie. It is one of the best examples of natural coastal prairie in our area. Davis has taken on the role of advocate for this prairie. He's being helped today by Lisa Hardcastle, who is also a member of the Galveston Bay Master Naturalists. She loves doing everything outside, but especially birding. I know that she gardens, she does bird rescues. In her former life, she was a teacher and attained an administrative position. And even better than that, she has become a great, very talented bird photographer and participates in many bird surveys. So take it away. Okay, thank you. Dick Benoit Perry is a 44-acre parkland in League City, just east of Marbella Parkway. It's a wonderful parkland. Andy Sippets thinks it's one of our best prairie remnants around. It includes special things like Mima Mounds, prairie puddles. It also includes a remnant of the Brazos River bed. Apparently, it's never been leveled for agricultural, and it was grazed before becoming preserved. It has several invasive plants, but it still has great diversity in a whole bunch of native plants. Andy says all that needs to be done is the invasives need to be removed. So we've taken the role of advocate for this prairie. And we partnered with John Orsag and Lisa Hardcastle and Linda Kuhn. Linda Kuhn was instrumental in getting the prairie certified by the Native Prairie Association of Texas. I'll let Lisa talk to you about who Dick Benoit was. Okay. Thank you, Davis. So I um, definitely want to recognize Dick Benoit. He is the founder of our Galveston Bay Area Chapter of Texas Master Naturalist, and he founded it in 1999. He approached Julie Massey and said, there's this thing and we really need to do it. I'm so glad he did this because it's a wonderful organization. We do great work. Um, he was one of the first Texas Master Naturalists to reach 10,000 volunteer service hours. That's a lot of volunteer time out there in the field. And he eventually went on to earn 15,000 volunteer service hours. He is recognized as a wonderful advocate for prairies and for the Gulf Coast. He was awarded the Gulf Guardian Award, and he was awarded the Terry Hershey Award from Houston. There's a great little YouTube video that I'm going to show you. It's such a good video. I'm Katie Benoit, and Dick Benoit was my dad, and I'm one of his three daughters. I was always the, the young daughter that would follow along, and he'd roll over logs so I could look at the bugs. <laughs> and collect things. He was a middle school teacher, environmentalist, for years up in Michigan. Um, and the grandkids initially brought him down, but then when we told him he could be outside uh, all year round down here, he was all for moving down here. Dick Benoit was the founder of our Texas Master Naturalist chapter. He established the chapter in 1999. He was just a wonderful example for us all. Uh, he was a Texas Master Naturalist for over 20 years. Uh, I think one of the first to achieve 10,000 volunteer hours. I think he fell in love with the prairies down here, um, that you only have so many of the coastal prairies around here, and he loves 
plants and animals and birds, and um, he just found his calling here for sure. The people who uh, discovered this property, they were associated with Texas Parks and Wildlife, and they knew Dick because he volunteered with him for so long, did so many great things for Texas Parks and Wildlife, that when they saw this property, they just wanted a name after him. So now you know a little bit about Dick Benoit. He did pass away last year, and that was sad for all of us, but he will live on in the Dick Benoit Prairie Preserve and many other activities that he was involved in. All right, Davis is going to now talk to you about prairies in general and then about very specific things about the Dick Benoit Prairie. Okay, a prairie is a grassland, mostly grassland, but it also includes lots of forbs and other species that are just generally found in our flat areas. The Texas coastal prairies were very extensive. We still only have about 1% of them left. So this is a very rare and valuable piece of property. This particular prairie was part of the Brazos River runoff and it does include an old Brazos River bed that flows through this prairie. The prairie includes lots of grasses, including little blue stem and gamma and switchgrass, Indian grass. We haven't seen big blue stem there, but hopefully it'll come back. It also includes lots of sedges and reeds. Uh, it's a very, very wet prairie. In fact, it was intended to be wet when it was created by the uh, text dot because it was a uh, set aside for when they built the, uh, the highway through there. So they wanted it to be a wet area that it would absorb lots of rain and rainwater that hit our prairie. Okay, you can, you can see the area included right here. You can see Highway 146 goes north and south along Galveston Bay on the right-hand side. And you can see the little waterway that goes through our prairie. That is actually an old Brazos River, one of the meanders of the Brazos River. And also you can see all kinds of little features on the prairie, Mima Mounds and prairie potholes. You can see it a little bit better up here. It's being surrounded now by Marbella subdivision. And you can see the artificial ponds that they created for the subdivision. But the Dick Benoit Prairie has some really nice wetlands and some very nice prairie areas. In our bio blitzes, we've identified over 168 species. So some of the flora, the plants that you're gonna see out there, we've got some pictures. These photos are by Linda Kuhn. She's done a really good job. Eastern Gamma, Bristle Thistle, World Milkweed, Obedient Plant, Grass-Leaved Arrowhead, Meadow Pink, American Beautyberry, Narrow Leaf Sunflower, Yopon Holly, Ground Seed Paspellum, Sharp Blazing Star, and Hair on Muley, as well as many other great glasses. We do have some invasives, and we'll be working on getting some of the invasives out of there. So this is the why we do what we do when we get out there and we're trying to not so much restore this prairie, but just clean it up a bit. The Nash, And I know I'm preaching to the choir here. The National Wildlife Federation says habitat loss is the primary threat to wildlife in the United States. And so that's why we want to make sure the Dick Benoit Prairie Preserve stays where it is and that it's cleaned up a little bit so that all of these animals that we've seen out there so far will thrive and more will come. Some of the things that we've found out here, insects, which we all know are great pollinators, the blacktail swallow is out there right now. These couple pictures were last month. The black swallowtail is one of our pollinators. 
as well as on the right-hand side of the southern carpenter bee. The southern carpenter bee is only found in coastal and gulf areas of the southeast United States, so it's important that we have habitat for that. The Halloween pennant in the center is very valuable to humans and other animals because it eats insects such as mosquitoes and gnats and those kinds of things that can be so bothersome. But, you know, 40% of insect species are declining and it's so important that we keep these habitats so they can thrive. One of the species that has really been affected by habitat destruction is the American bumblebee. It used to be found throughout the United States in general, but now eight states in the New England area have lost the American bumblebee. So it's important that we keep them where they are and hopefully they'll spread back to the north eventually. The skipper in the center is a great pollinator and we have, I've seen lots of skippers out there through the summertime. So we're glad to have the skippers. Now, when you guys look at that fire ant float there, you're probably thinking, yuck, I don't like fire ants. They're one of the few insects that I will treat in my gardens, in my lawn, because they are bothersome if you're out and about in them. But I looked up to see if there's any benefits of fire ants, and there are. There are studies that show that they reduce tick populations, as well as chiggers, fleas, and cockroaches. So while we don't love them, maybe the next time you see fire ants, you can appreciate them a little bit. The picture there, Davis and I were out this winter in the um, prairie. I would say a good 80 to 90 percent of the prairie was 18 inches deep of water. It rose to the very tippy top of my boots that I was wearing. And we saw this raft of fire ants float by and certainly avoided those fire ants, but they're definitely out there. There are some mammals, we have not observed many of them. I was out there about a month ago, and actually the last two months I've been out there, one day I saw two coyotes run through, and another day I saw just one coyote. I didn't take the opportunity to take a picture because I was trying to figure out whether I needed to be worried. But I didn't need to be worried. They're not going to bother me. They wanted to get by me as fast as possible. I have seen up to five white-tailed deer out there. And you'll see this one I took a picture of last month. And he has these nice antlers growing there. He was with another male deer. And so I was very excited to see him. As I said before, I've seen up to five at a time. If I get out there early enough in the morning, they'll be out in the prairie. You can see this one was pretty close to the houses in the background. Other mammals that are probably out there would include cottontail rabbits, cotton rats, rice rats. I live near the um, prairie and I certainly have my share of rats in my backyard. Nutria are probably out there, especially in that wet time. Armadillos, possums, and raccoons are likely out there as well, although we haven't seen them yet and they want to avoid us anyway. We do see a lot of crawfish holes out there and there's been some snakes sighted out there as well. My favorite topic are the birds. We have made uh, the prairie a hot spot on eBird. If you are a birder, you'll see it there. I make a point to get out there at least once a month to document the birds that are out there. We have now a complete one year's worth of data and we've seen 68 species. And so we'll of course hope for a lot more as the prairie develops a bit. These are just some of the common birds that we see every month out there. They're flying around, they're on the wires, they're in the trees. Other common birds that we see almost every month are the Carolina chickadee, American crow, Carolina wren. Oh, there's a bunch of those out there. Red-bellied woodpeckers and downy woodpeckers. Because even though the prairie only has one major tree out there, it's surrounded by another piece of property that has trees. They are hollow trees, but they are trees. So the woodpeckers are in there. Some other birds we see out there are the songbirds and these pictures were about two months ago because it had rained and the cardinal was soaking wet so he was pretty happy. 
the gray catbird on the right hand side oh, was just singing his heart out um, perched up there. Other birds that sing quite a bit that we've seen out there are the American robin, orange crowned warbler, yellow warbler during migration, yellow rump warbler during the winter time, and the white eyed vireo we saw last month. There are houses put, uh, right adjacent to the prairie. And so some of these birds, I believe, are there kind of because they're compatible with human beings, especially when human beings have a bird feeder out there like this bird is on. At our April workday, we saw indigo buntings back there. We saw several, and this is a nice female and male pair of buntings. This is a female rose-breasted grosbeak. And on the far east side of the prairie, there's more housing back there. And I believe somebody has some bluebird houses because there's bluebirds back there, or perhaps they're in the adjacent woodlot that is right next to the prairie. I also saw a ruby-threaded hummingbird last month when I was there, too. I did not get a picture of it, but it was there. It's really neat, the birds that are out in the grassy area. This is a male and female red-winged blackbirds, but other birds that frequent those grasses with the seeds are the wrens, such as sedge wren, the sparrows like the field sparrow, swamp sparrow, savannah sparrow are out there. These are Phoebe, scissor tail flycatchers have all been seen out there, barn swallows flying through the area. I saw a northern harrier fly through the prairie one day looking for something to nibble. To me, the most fun is when the prairie acts as a water reservoir for the neighborhood. As I've already said, we had about two months where the water was quite deep in there, and we got a plethora of wading birds. My pictures don't do them justice. This was a, unbelievably, it's a roseate spoonbill, even though he's not very pink. He was either juvenile or did not go breed. So he has not very much pink color. Maybe it's the diet he's eating. He just kind of walked in front of me about 100 feet ahead of me and made a big circle of the main part of the prairie. Little blue herons out there. I saw five or six at the time I saw this one. In the back part of it, there's a wetland area with lots of cattails and spider lilies. And these white ibis were out there feeding. There were probably about 25 or 30 eating those crawfish and other invertebrates out there. Amazingly, we've seen ducks because the water is so deep. We've seen mallard ducks and mottled ducks. In addition to the herons, we've seen egrets, great egrets, snow egret, tricolor heron. I live near the prairie and I drive by and during those wet times, there were always birds you could see from the road eating in the wet areas out there. Very excitingly, we had Wilson snipes during the winter. Unfortunately, they were hard to take picture of because as soon as we approached them, they flushed and flew off. But those were nice birds to know that they were out there. When we're out there, we have to remember to look up because so many birds fly between 57 Acre Park, which if you know the area, Right across 96 from Dick Benoit Prairie is an obviously 57 acre park owned by Kima. It's a great birding spot. So some of those wading birds I knew were flying back and forth between the area and lots of other birds fly back and forth between the two areas. In addition to this tree swallow, there's other swallows that we've seen out there. The red shoulder hawk is out there every time we've gone out. The wood stork was just a random flyby in November of last year. Other birds we see out there, black vultures, turkey vultures, osprey, Mississippi kites flying around the area, Cooper's hawks, broad wing hawks, American kestrel all winter long back there. The gulls fly to Kima because we're so close to the water there. So we've seen lots of laughing gulls and ring-billed gulls flying between the properties. Okay, David's already mentioned this. We were very fortunate that Linda Kuhn was instrumental in applying for designation of this prairie as a native Texas prairie. And so that process involved filling out some paperwork that included the history of the prairie, 
a description of the location, the plants, the amount of invasive plants out there, and management plans for that piece of property. And the importance of doing this is really great. League City was super excited about this. They posted it on their Facebook page. It was in their weekly manager newsletter that comes out to people. And they've posted these signs on the perimeter of the prairie. So it's great PR. It lets people know, you know, sometimes people aren't real happy to see a piece of property that's growing kind of wild. But now we can point to this great designation as a native Texas prairie. And the Native Texas Prairie Association says that it reflects a commitment to protect the natural heritage of the property. So we're very excited to have that relationship with the city. I'm going to talk about work days that the master naturalists have done out there. It is a project of our chapter, which means that people can get hours for working out there and that we're committed to keeping up the work and the planning for those work days. So we've had two work days in October of 2022 and in April of 2023, and we have one coming up. And the exciting thing about these work days is that the city staff come out and help us with that. And so the parks and recreation people come out and we spend half a day out there. Some people are doing invasive plant removal, some people are iNaturalisting it. Um, some people are taking pictures. It's a good time to get out there and experience the prairie and build that re deeper relationship with the city. I do have a video from YouTube and I'll talk a little bit more about the relationship we have. Recently, the Dick Benoit Prairie Preserve just became a uh, certified Texas native prairie. And uh, that's just a designation that you get for coastal prairies that are pristine, have uh, good e ecosystems, and, and this, such as this one, they've discovered over 200 types of plant species so far. Dick Benoit was the founder of our Texas Master Naturalist chapter, and so we're proud to make this prairie part of our one of our chapter projects. We come out here and we do a bio blitz, which means we look at all the plants and identify them. We also take care of the prairie. We eliminate invasive species like tallow trees. So we work hard to take care of this prairie. Very important for biodiversity and to keep it, all of our uh, native species alive. It's important for birds, for reptiles and uh, mammals. So we want to make sure they uh, have a chance to survive and people have a plant, place to see them. So again, you know, the city is really proud to have this piece of property and they put that video on their Facebook page as well. And so we have a great working relationship with them and commitment from them. I do want to say that you're all invited to come out and join us for this October 4th workday, 8.30 to 11 in the morning. Dress appropriately for the weather. Hopefully it'll be a chilly October day. We can dream about that. Close toed shoes, long pants, long sleeves are recommended. Hat and bring your water bottle and tools if you have them, but we'll have some with us. And you can either, you know, I saw the guy pulling the tree down. You don't have to be that involved. We have jobs for every work level out there. Future plans Lake City's committed to open spaces. Happy resident that they have a commitment to that. It's in their master plan for parks, trails, and open spaces. Long-term plan for the city is they'd like to see a parking area there because we don't have a parking place. You cannot park on 96 if you are going there for a work day or for any other reason. You have to park on Marbella. But they'd like to build a parking area, restrooms, and nature trails. And then some of our chapter members are working with the city to come up with a management plan that will help them know when to mow. It'll help them know what plants need to be removed and what we need to plant, if any at all. I did want to just put a bug in right now because the city doesn't want people going out there by themselves. Mostly it's about parking. So come out for our work day. Let one of us know if you really want to go out there. I'd love to have somebody go out there and bird with me. So the next slide has Davis in mind. 
contact information. So thank you for your interest in the prairie and open for questions now. Is the city mowing and how often? The city mows once a year. They were mowing about three times a year, but we have got them to commit to only once a year. Hopefully it'll be in the late winter after all the bioactivity is finished. And we're hoping that I'll stick with that schedule. They're open to our suggestions and are really working with us on that. Does the city clean all of the equipment before mowing so as to uh, reduce the spread of invasive plants? Ooh, great question. I've talked to with them about that, and they say they do clean it. I think that's a good point to reemphasize. And when we have our meeting with uh, John, we'll go over that again. What method do you use to remove invasive plants? On mature tallow trees, we cut them down, and then we spray them with a uh, broadleaf herbicide. Smaller trees, we will clip with the loppers and spray the stumps. We are working on some of the invasive plant, invasive grasses. We've got a problem there, and we don't have a perfect plan for those, but we are working with some uh, some ideas on how to get rid of some of those invasive grasses. We've got, specifically, we've got Vasey grass, Johnson grass, and uh, like uh, your regular lawn grasses, like uh, St. Augustine. So those are our big, big ones. What about mowing the edges more often than the center to keep invasive species from creeping into the prairie? That's one thing that we've asked them to do is mow along that edge, especially along Marbella. That edge is the worst part. And it, we think that when the uh, city made that road, they introduced a lot of invasive species. TxDOT is well known for planting things like KR blue stem, another of those ground cover grasses that they do when they put in a highway. So we think they did some of that. And we are planning on doing some mowing and spraying along that on along that edge. When is the next bio blitz? And can they all participate in it? That'll be on that work day. So I should have made it clearer. So everybody can there's a job for everybody on a work day. So some of the people have chainsaws with them and are gonna cut down that tree, those trees. So most, a lot of us go out with loppers and hit the small shrubs that are um, the tallow trees starting to grow. Other people are out there doing the bio blitz. So you can bring equipment like loppers or a chainsaw if that's your thing, or your phone could be the tool that you're going to bring out and do, or or camera to do the, that bio blitz. Davis has set up two projects in iNaturalist, so you can upload right to that project and it'll be in our tally. So that would be the day that we could do it. Of course, if you native plant people wanna to get together and propose a date to go out there too, we could work with the city to, to have another day as well. Yeah, we can go out and do a seed collection mm -hmm. or anything like that that you would like to do if we plan ahead with the city. Right. When is the regular birding times? Do you have a regular birding event out there? Not yet. Davis and I usually communicate and say, oh, you want to go out and bird? And we do it. But um, we can definitely talk about having a regular time. You know, it's so much dependent on the weather. Because really, when it gets muddy, that is a slog through there. And there's no trails yet. All right. Well, I think that's the end of our questions. And I want to thank you. We're going to move along because we do have another half for the day. Rowena is an environmental education assistant with EIH Environmental Education Program. She obtained her bee farm from the University of Witzwaterrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. Rowena is pursuing a master's degree in environmental science from UHCL. She's a master naturalist. She's a strong member of the Native Plant Society. She's worked in hospital and community pharmacies in South Africa. Africa and the UK, and after arriving in Texas, she volunteered extensively 
with community youth programs. McDermott's focus at EIH is coordinating youth programs such as the Youth Birding Club and Summer Nature Camps. She's also been a past lead for Nipsot's plant sales, and she is a strong member. She participates and does a lot for us. Hello, my name is Rowena McDermott. This is the very abbreviated story of how we improved a half acre of prairie habitat on the UHCL campus. The work was funded by a grant from the Coastal Management Program via NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. We started in September 2021 and will hopefully wrap the project up by the end of this year. The prairie doesn't have an official name yet. We are just calling it the Nature Trail Prairie. And uh, we use the words prairie and savanna interchangeably, although that isn't correct. But it's the prairie plants we're interested in, although it is technically a savanna habitat. So what is the difference between a savanna habitat and a prairie habitat? Why are we calling it? prairie slash savanna restoration. Well, the word prairie describes a landscape dominated by grass species, whereas the word savanna describes a grassland with scattered trees. Grasslands given other names in other parts of the world, such as pampas in South America, steppes in Central Eurasia, and felt in Southern Africa. Savanna occurs as a wooded area, for example, a riparian woodland, transitions into prairie. The understory comprises prairie plants. Degraded prairies that used to be savanna may be a good target for restoring prairie habitat because the soil is often undisturbed. The degradation of the habitat has occurred because of the overgrowth of woody plants, not because of plowing and overgrazing. The picture on the left is a prairie, probably the poster boy prairie, which complete with grazing bison at Yellowstone National Park. And the photograph on the right is of a savanna habitat at Tyler State Park, which has been restored after a program of prescribed burns. So this slide shows a side-by-side -side comparison of an image of the UHCL campus taken by aerial photography in 1978 and a 2020 satellite image from Google Earth. This green little shape here shows where our prairie restoration site is in both of the pictures. The bayou building is in both images. We can see the bayou building in the 1978 photograph, as well as in the 2020 Google image. It has to be said, Bayou Building was a lot younger in those days. The differences between the two pictures are really the horse pen Bayou, which here in 1978 was a lot wider and less symmetrical than it is now. Look at all the uneven edges on the banks giving lots of habitat, whereas in this photograph, it has been smoothed out and channelized. In this image, the 1978 image, you can see the riparian zone here. This color change is a bit deceptive. This is two photographs stitched together. But you can see the riparian zone thinning out into a savanna habitat with fewer trees and the grassland or the prairie takes over. So this is the pipeline easement, pretty much as it is today, it was in existence then. So this prairie would have continued all the way over there through where the parking lot is and most of the campus would have been prairie, although now it looks as though it is mostly wooded habitat. You go to the 2020 photograph, you're going to see that all of that space has filled in with trees. And there's a pipeline easement, just as with the other one. And this is where our project is placed. So our project is a pilot project. Uh, was well, a pilot project because we've nearly finished it. 
It's a two-acre pilot study to determine which restoration method will be most successful at this site. The site was divided into four plots, plot A, plot B, plot C, and plot D. And they're each treated differently. Plot A, all except the oldest trees, were cleared. The chippings were removed to create a nice seed bed. And it was sown with native seed that was both collected and purchased. This plot B was treated the same as A, but there was no seed sown. And then plot C, also it cleared of excess trees, but the chippings were left in place. And once again, there was no seed sown. And then plot T, we didn't do anything at all. It was completely left alone. So all the plots, both during the project time and in the future, will be subject to prescribed fire conditions and permissions allowing. We didn't get the opportunity to burn the entire plot during the scope of this project, mostly because not there being enough fuel to keep a fire going, and the fact that the woodland area here was mostly dry undergrowth, and we would have required quite a hot fire to actually thin it out, and we didn't want to do that, which deemed a safety risk. So we did manage to burn this area earlier this year. The objective is to determine if there was a viable seed bank remaining in the soil after 40 years. And we also wanted to see if leaving the chippings in place would hinder the infiltration of non-native species in any way, and also if that would compost down inside of a year. I know other projects in the nearby have been chipping their trees and then burning the mulch. Uh, we did not want to burn the mulch. It creates a lot of smoke, which for where we are is completely unsuitable. We would never get permission to do that. Uh, but we wanted to see if it would compost down in that time. For vegetation surveys, quadrat plots were sampled down the long transect line of each plot, like so, in the middle, to get a good idea of what vegetation was growing. So this is the same image as an earlier slide, but here the 1944 plant communities have been drawn on top of a 2020 image. So this is our pilot project site. This dark green area shows riparian wetland. This darker blue shows where Horsepen Bayou is now, and the lighter blue shows where Horsepen Bayou used to flow in 1944. This area here is your post oak savanna. These are the tall prairie, and this is wet tall prairie. This larger triangle is the site of our proposed phase two. What we're doing with this project is just this smaller area here. Okay, so the first thing we had to do was remove the trees. This is the massive piece of machinery that was used to remove the trees. Basically, the vegetation was pushed over to the ground and then chipped where it lay. This was the cheapest of the options that we considered. Um, the contractor did remove some of the resulting mulch mechanically, especially where we wanted it to, plots A and B. But because it is so heavy and it was compressing the soil, we didn't ask him to clear it completely. He couldn't have been able to manage it anyway. Uh, so the rest of it had to be raked off by hand. That was quite a lot of work. We needed to do that to create a clear bed for seeding. Some of you may know that we have a, another project, a sister project, happening concurrently over at Entrance 2. That was between the facilities management and a group of students who wanted to put a prairie in place. And facilities wanted to thin out the trees in that area and put lawn in. So we dissuaded them from doing that and suggested a 
prairie habitat instead. And the way we got our way we managed to persuade them was they, you know, instead of having to mow every week in the summer, they could mow twice a year. So they were quite taken with that. And I'm very pleased to say they're very happy with the result of the prairie in that area. But what they did was they got trees taken out individually and completely removed. There was no chippings at all. And there was a lot less disturbance in the area, at, in the soil. There was less woody overgrowth in that area. And also, please remember, it was being paid for out of a completely different pot of money. So they weren't looking at the same considerations we were looking. We also wanted to figure out something that could be scaled up. So this is a before and after picture. Here you get a good view of just how overgrown the woods were. It was very difficult in part, especially around the edges, to get into between the trees, just mark where the different sites were going to be and where we wanted uh, the contractor to mulch and where he wanted him to leave it alone. That took quite a bit of doing and tripping and scratching and knocking knees and that kind of thing. So this is completely different now. It, um, you can see all the chipping lying on the ground. It's all completely open. And this is now our seed bed for planting. So we seeded using a seed drill. This bag of fluff is our seed mix. Approximately half of it was collected by hand and cleaned by hand, all by volunteers. And the rest was purchased from uh, Native American seed and also Douglas King seeds. We used a seed drill rather than sowing by hand because the seed drill makes a very small indentation in the ground. It really doesn't disturb the soil that much. But each seed is covered with a little bit of soil. And that helps with germination. It helps it from blowing, you know, helps prevent it from blowing away in the wind. And it also helps some of the seed, you know, a lot of seed, when you, if you sow by hand, it's going to be scavenged by birds. And um, we went to a lot of trouble to get the seed. We were sowing a lot of seed, but we really didn't want the birds to have the majority of this seed that we were putting in the ground. As I mentioned, we put a lot of seed down. We seeded at a rate of 36 pounds per acre, which is a lot. It's about twice what is generally recommended. It was the most that could be put into the ground by this particular seed drill. And the reason we did that was because Wendy and I were both absolutely terrified that we were just going to get invasives taking over. Our worst case scenario would be spending all this money, removing all these trees, and then ending up with two acres of Chinese tallow, which would be worse than what we started off with. So we wanted to make sure that we took every precaution we could to try and prevent an invasion of invasive species, have them take over the plot before our prairie could mature, and one of the ways we did this was by sowing the seed very thickly on the ground. OK, so a huge shout out to our volunteers. Um, we would not have succeeded with this project without their help. So clockwise from the left, we have the Environmental Justice Association student organization, which organized a big day work day to help remove the excess mulch. The next photo at 12 o'clock shows a group of students from the Environmental Justice Association who came out two times a week for many, many weeks, a couple of hours at a time to help remove mulch. They really did a lot of work on this project. The next photograph is uh, showing a huge hole that was dug for a soil survey. If it was a bit longer, we'd call it a soils pit, but uh, that was hard work getting down as far as we did there. The next photograph down shows um, all the tires that were removed during a volunteer work day. And that was before we even had any trees removed. We noticed there were a lot of tires lying on the site. And so we organized a work day to get them removed. And we ended up removing over 70 tires. And the final photograph down there at six o'clock is a volunteer out in the prairie picking seed for us. Okay, and so our results. 
These two photographs are both of plot A. Don't they look great? We're so happy it turned out so well. Uh, germination went really, really well. And we are attributing this to a really good soil bed for planting and favorable weather conditions. It rained just a few days before we sowed, and then it rained several times a week or a few weeks after the seed was sowed. We could not have asked for better weather. Plots B and C have not been pictured. They're less fun to look at. There is some photographs later on in the presentation. The results from plot B, remember that's the plot where we did remove all the mulch, all the chippings, but we didn't put any seed down. And there is no indication from what we're growing on that site that there is a viable seed bank left in the soil. We believe the climate here is too warm and wet for any but the toughest seed to survive, especially for 40 years. Plot C, despite all the mulch left on the ground, was overgrown with invasive species, especially Chinese tallow and China berry. Far from the mulch suppressing these weeds, they seem to encourage it. In fact, the weeds seem to be coming from the actual mulch itself. It was very discouraging. Um, during the course of the project, we had to go in with herbicide quite a lot. We asked FMC to keep chopping things down. Yeah, it's, it was a lot of hard work that summer to try and keep that all under control. Okay, so here are some other photographs from the summer of 2022. Clockwise on the top left, we have uh, butterfly milkweed, Asclepius tuberosa. This here is Rio Grande clammy weed. Now, this is not native to this area, but speaking with prairie restoration expert Tim Sigmund from the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, he suggested that I buy some of the seed and put it in. And it will bloom, it, it grows and blooms for the first couple of years, but it really is just a placeholder. It eventually will stop growing here because it's not native to this particular area. But in the meantime, the slower growing grasses have a chance to mature. And as you can see last year, it did bloom. It looked ever so pretty and the pollinators loved it. The next picture along is aquatic milkweed, Asclepius perennis. Down here, we have some side oats grama, Butalea curtipendula. And here we have complete with the butterfly this plant is a host for. There is a Gulf Coast fritillary there. This is the passion flower, otherwise known as the maypop, Passiflora incarnata. Not shown, but other species that were spotted growing in the prairie were, and excuse me, I'm just going to use common names, swamp sunflower, Indian blanket, Mexican hat, black-eyed Susan, Texas coneflower, American basket flower, Lemon bee balm, partridge pea, Maximilian sunflower, green milkweed, crossweed, and gay feather. And I'm sure there are a couple of more that I've forgotten to mention. And as well as the side oats grammar, we've also had little blue stem growing there, silver blue stem, big blue stem did really well, yellow Indian grass, love grass, golf muley, long spike tridents, purple top, and purple three awn. So we were very pleased how that went. Okay, as I mentioned, our biggest nightmare, both before and during the actual project, was keeping invasive species at bay. It was one of our biggest fears, and it is a huge challenge. The picture on the left shows plot C with all this mulch, and this is hundreds and hundreds of little Chinese tallow seedlings taking root. The photograph on the right is Jeffrey, one of our amazing students. He's dealing with a patch of vasi grass using a herbicide glyphosate in a backpack sprayer. And I am sure there are those of you out there who are absolutely disapproving of us using herbicide on our prairie restoration. In our defense, Really, it was the only way we could keep things under control. It's not ideal, but these grasses can propagate 
vegetatively as well as by seed. And, you know, we can dig them up, but some of the root will always remain in the ground. And then also physically removing the plant disturbs the soil even more. So it allows other invasive species to take hold. What we did with the invasive species, there are various tactics that we used. Where if we caught them small enough, we pulled them out by hand. We used glyphosate on the grasses and the sedges, triclopyr for broadleaf plants like the Chinese tallow. We had a, they're still continuing to do it, a team of volunteers removing Chinese tallow from the surrounding woodlands. And uh, we have the grounds crew mowing the pipeline adjacent to our prairie on a regular basis to prevent all the invasive grasses from producing seed there. Our main offenders so far are Chinese tallow. No surprises there. China berry, which did surprise me because, to be honest, I hadn't been aware of it actually even being on campus before it started growing in our cleared area. Invasive grass, Johnson grass, they're common throughout campus. We were not surprised to see that at all. And of course, deep rooted sedge decided to get a look in there as well. So what are our next steps? Well, first of all, we are hoping it's going to rain soon. The prairie at the moment is looking quite crispy. Mature prairies are resilient to flood and drought, but our prairie is still newly planted. It is still vulnerable. And for that reason, we are asking visitors to the prairie, you're more than welcome to come along and take a look at it. But we're asking people to refrain from picking seed, at least until the, the plot has a chance to mature a little bit more. We want to seed plot B and plot C that have a lot of non-prairie plants growing there at the moment, as well as a lot of invasive species. So our plan is to herbicide the area a couple of months before we want to plant just before the end of the growing season because both of the herbicides we're using work better when the plant is actively growing then we hope to be able to create a clean seed bed for the seeds to be planted more seed to be planted later on this fall there is a new section of trail also being added using the grant money this is an ADA compliance trail it's going in as we speak. It's looking very good. Following along from that trail, when that's ready, some informational signage will be added. And then again, as I mentioned before, if we can get funding, we would like to increase the project over phase two to create about 10 acres of prairie altogether. We are not going to attempt to do prairie restoration throughout campus. Uh, there is a lot of it to be done, and it does require maintenance to keep it as prairie. And really, our facilities, you know, they've been very cooperative, but more than 10 acres would be too much of an ask. But 10 acres will give everyone visiting campus and all the students on campus a very good opportunity to see what a prairie should look like and be able to see the change of prairie to post oak savannah to a riparian zone and then on down to the bayou. I haven't mentioned the post oak trees. I have missed that out. There are some, you know, because of the site not being ploughed, a lot of the soil features remain, including uh, Mima mounds. And on some of the Mima mounds, there are still post oaks growing. Wendy, don't ask me how, I, by magic, managed to get a lot of acorns from a post oak and we managed to get them to germinate. And we have put about 50 tiny seedlings into the ground, tiny seedlings in areas where we feel they have a good chance of surviving. Now, we don't expect a very high percentage of survival rate, but even if just 10% of those who grow to mature trees, uh, we feel we'll have achieved something there. And I would like to say thank you very much for listening. This lovely blue butterfly here in the photograph is a white checkered skipper. Again, thank you very much. Of the species in plot A, were any determined to have come from the seed bank rather than seed mix? Hi, Wendy. <laughs> it's Wendy and Andy, sorry. I know. So we did a um, 
I worked with Rowena and some of the students. We did a complete census of everything out there in the unplanted area. And what we found was the there were some wetland plants. Wetland plants typically have really long-lived seeds. So some juncus, some rushes, and some beak rushes. And uh, the only prairie plant was um, uh, mimosa, the little pink, what do you call it, powder puff flower, which has a really hard seed. That, that survived as well. But that, that was about it. What service will be used for the ADA trail? We're putting down uh, crushed granite will be the surface on the top. And it's going into um, like a plastic grid to hold it in place. So we're pretty excited about that. They should be finished with that trail actually in a couple of weeks, I think. There was one other quick question. It says, will the crushed granite trail impact the drainage pattern of that property? And we are hoping that the answer is no. We did put some culverts in there to prevent any kind of flooding of the area, so it should not. And it's also a porous material. Okay, well, thank you very much. We always appreciate having people come. We'll see you next time.